Hello everyone and an incredibly warm welcome to the first in a new series of Being Human Lectures brought to you by the Health and Social Care Academy, which is a programme of the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland, which is Nat Scotland's national third sector intermediary for health and social care. The Being Human series will explore the importance of embedding human rights into health and social care policy and practice, and will highlight the stigma, discrimination and inequality faced by disabled people, people living with long-term conditions and unpaid carers in Scotland. This event is delivered in partnership with SCLD, the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities. This organisation is a long-term friend, partner and member of the Alliance and works to defend the human rights of people with learning disabilities in Scotland. I'm Lucy Mulvey and I'm delighted to be chairing today. I'm usually the Alliance's Policy and Communications Director, but I'm currently on secondment as the Secretariat Lead for Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights hosted by the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Yesterday, the Commission published a blog that I wrote about the National Action Plan, also known as SNAP, and I'll share a link to that in the chat function later. Today's event will be recorded and shared online tomorrow, the 10th of December, which is International Human Rights Day. The theme for this year's Human Rights Day is equality reducing inequalities and advancing human rights. What better way to mark this occasion with this first in the new Being Human series? We can also put a link to more information about International Human Rights Day in the chat. Before I introduce our first speakers today, I'll just explain a little bit about the format. We'll first hear from members of SCLD's Human Rights Town App Development Group, who are going to tell us about this fantastic new app. I am a huge fan. We'll then hear from our guest speaker, Rosemary KS. Again, I am a huge fan. We'll then have a short stretch and screen break. And when we come back, we'll have a question session with Rosemary before we finish no later than 12 o'clock. We're hosting today's event in what's called webinar format. That means if you want to ask a question, and please do ask questions throughout the session, then do so using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom app. If you require any technical support, please do get in touch with Nick Watt at the Alliance on the chat function. And for those of you on Twitter, the hashtag for today is BeingHuman21 for any tweets you want to share. That's a capital B, capital H, and the numbers two and one. And please do use the chat function to introduce yourself, say hello, tell us where you're joining from, and share any thoughts you might have. But use the Q&A function for any specific question for our speakers. So I'm now delighted to hand over to Una Brown from SCLD and John Gallen, Fiona Dawson and Sandy Starr, who are members of SCLD's Human Rights Town App Development Group. John, Fiona and Sandy contribute to a number of national and local groups working to influence policy and legislation that impacts people with learning disabilities in Scotland. So I think it's over to you, John. Thank you, Lucy. Um, a, a very uh, uh, hello everyone and good morning. Uh, thank you for having us along this morning uh, today to talk to you about the Human Rights Town App. It is a very exciting opportunity to present alongside Rosemary Keynes. Uh, we welcome and we welcome this opportunity. So to kick us off, we're going to introduce ourselves. So my name is John Gallen. I live in Nairn in the Highlands. I have been involved with SELD for over five years. I am part of the Keys to Life expert group. I have my own flat and I am a very busy man with a lot on. 
I know a lot about human rights and I've done a lot of work about self-directed support. I have been involved with the National Involvement Network. I wanted to help with the app because I am passionate about people with learning disabilities, having the choice, flexibility and control. Brilliant, thanks, John. Sandy, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm um, Sandy, I'm from um, Aberdeen. I've been involved with the SALD um, for, for a number of years and um, been involved in, in a lot of um, a, different workshops and um, making sure that people with learning disabilities get their voices heard. Brilliant, thanks, Sandy. Fiona, it's over. Oh, and sorry, no, it's not over to Fiona yet. Um, why did you want to help to create the Human Rights Town app, Sandy? Um, because I think it's very, very, very important for people with learning disabilities the, to make sure that they get to to make sure that they get their rights, and um, that this could be to you know right to their own flat or right to employment. Um, so I th I I I feel um but by um contributing to to the Human Rights Town app um and um he 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 hearing experiences from people with um lived experiences of learning disabilities all um open so many doors for um people with uh, learning disabilities or a disability. Brilliant, thanks, Sandy. Now it's over to Fiona. <coughs> Hello, my name is Fiona Dawson. I live in Ayr in South Ayrshire. I have worked with SALG for a long, long time. I started in 2017 after I won the Sport Achievement Award. Through lockdown, I have been doing projects with SALG, like making a video about hate crime, making a human rights town app, and the coronavirus research. I am involved in the, in the people-led policy panel at Inclusion Scotland, and we talk about adult social care and human rights. I'm also an Ecofutures ambassador. Also with us today is Una from SELD. I wanted to help with Human Rights Town App because I feel strongly about human rights. Not only I do feel strongly a stand for human rights. Making the Human Rights Town app has felt like a long journey that we have all been on together. To, today we are going to talk to you about key points along our journey, like writing the scenarios bringing them to life and making sure the app worked. Brilliant. Thanks, Fiona. Over to you, John. Thank you, Una. Um, so, the, so um, the first part of the journey we did was writing the scenarios for the app. We came together as a group to discuss what we wanted the stories to be about. We were shown different rights and we had to come up with different stories, which explained what each right was and what they meant to us. We also had to think about places and names for, for the stories. One of the stories I developed was about a lady called Mary who wanted to join a cooking class at a local community centre, but her parents wouldn't let her join because they were very strict. This story was about people with learning disabilities having the right to independence and be able to learn new skills. People with learning disabilities should be able to join the groups they want to be involved with. I am a member of a cookery class 
and everyone is very friendly. At my cooking class, I've learned how to chop vegetables and how to cook food. It is a oh, bit too fast, Una. Sorry. <laughs> um, it is very supportive and has really improved my life since the pandemic. What I liked about helping developing the app was about having a voice and getting to decide what the app looks like. It was important to members of the group to be able to have a say about the stories in the app. Thanks, John. So over to you now, Sandy. John, tell us about the making the voice recordings. Um, making the voice recordings was very, very successful um, because um, I'm a radio um a volunteer for my radio a, a, a st station up here in Aberdeen, and um, you, you know, so I had a lot. I I had a lot of confidence on, on making the um voice recordings, and a uh, we 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 just wanted to make this app as you you know successful, and a you know, open to everyone that has um, a disability. So if this was, a, a, you know, a problem um, for, 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 for people that might um, struggle with re reading and writing, um, the, the, the um, scenarios could be, um, a, you, you could listen back to the s scenarios and um, that, 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 that would um, help you pr progress through the, the Human Rights Town app. Brilliant, thanks, Sandy. Um, and do you want to say um, a little bit about um, about your experience making the recordings? Did it take you Did it take you a number of times to get them to get get it right? What was it like? Um, uh, quite, quite a few times just to start off with, but um, one, what, 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 once I got the first scenario um, out the way, and um, I, I think I maybe done three or three or four after that, and, and it just sort of came natural, really, because it was. Um, I just felt I, re I really, really had to get it, it right for, for for people with, with learning disabilities. But uh, at the end of the day, I was still human. And, um, you, you know, everyone makes a, a, little, a little bit of, of a mistake. But, but I think I, I, I just think that, that that just shows you how much people, um, you know, support the um. The, the the human rights time up. Brilliant, thanks, Sandy. So Fiona, over to you. I am now going to talk about the last part of our journey, which was making the app work. We tested it all the buttons and made sure it was all working. I found issues in having to double click on some buttons to make it work. I found issues where sometimes the sound didn't play. I thought the app was very colourful, especially the map. I found the app very useful and I can see people with learning disabilities being able to use it. In the future, we want the app to have people moving around and more visitor attractions. We also wanted to have voice control. Once we made sure the app worked, we made it to our final destination, the app launch. The app launch was attended by over 100 people from across the world. We also had video contrib contributions from Sir Robert Martin and Rosemary Keyes from the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We are now going to play a video about the app.
John, is it back John, over to you now? It is, yes. So, um, just to finish, before we finish off our presentation, here's a picture of everybody from the app development group who who done you know who done this and we we work you know we work you know great as a team you know we supported each other um you know it was it was our app so it was you know it wasn't the organization it was our ideas which we we you know which you know it's all about and um and we do, it's just been an incredible journey you know getting this forward so it, it's really good so we're going to tell you our plans now so um our plans for the future of the app is to do a version two update so we're hoping to do more scenario stories um, it'd be good to hear from you all because you might have ideas, which would be so grateful for that. Um, you know, maybe putting more places on the map, or um, which will be fantastic. Um, with more scenarios, we will continue to work alongside uh, the brilliant SCLD because uh, they are brilliant. Uh, brilliant what they do, uh, to defend the human rights of people with learning disabilities. We even want, if we get more funding, we want to, we want to expand and have to have a human rights town at Roadshow around Scotland, um, because it, it Back, it was my idea for this actually, um, because this is the way forward now. Because you know, this has been so popular, and you know, and we want to meet everybody now, and then you can meet us as well. And you know, and we will go and di visit different people as well, you know. So, it you know, it we're gonna be we're gonna be well known. When you know when we do this, um, but 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 we need more funding first. So um, so watch this space. Watch this space. Um, so a huge thank you for listening to us this morning. Remember to download the app on Apple App Store and Google Play, and have you if you have any questions for us please contact Una on the email address on the screen. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Well, thank you so much. A huge thanks to Una, Don, Fiona and Sandy for telling us about this wonderful app. And um, for those of you who haven't explored it yet, why not? Um, I can personally highly recommend it. It's the favourite thing on my smartphone at the moment. It's lovely to look at. It's full of great information. And you heard it here first, folks. Keep your eyes peeled for the Human Rights Town at Roadshow, uh, which I'm sure when COVID allows uh, and funding, we can get funding for that. It can Everybody can be out and about to meet and discuss the app in more detail. So without further ado, I'm now delighted to welcome today's guest speaker, Rosemary K.S., internationally recognised and well-respected human rights lawyer in the area of disability. As I'm sure you will know, in 2019, Rosemary became the chairperson of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of Disabled People, which is the independent body that oversees countries' implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, also known as the CRPD. Rosemary is the first Australian woman to be put in this post. And in fact, Rosemary was a des designated expert on the Australian government delegation to the UN negotiations for the CRPD and facilitated the drafting of Article 24, which is on the right. But these are not the only roles that Rosemary has or currently plays. 
She has devoted her career thus far to disability policy and reform and has advised and advises on issues as diverse as housing, education, guardianship and employment. Rosemary is a human rights lawyer and director of engagement in the Disability Innovation Institute of the University of New South Wales in Australia. And she also teaches at that university faculty of law. We are absolutely delighted and honoured that Rosemary is able to join us today. And I would also like to point out that because of the time difference, I believe it's currently something like eight or nine o'clock in the evening where Rosemary is joining us from in Sydney. So an extra special thanks also for joining us well into your evening hours. And just a reminder to you all, as Rosemary delivers her presentation, please don't forget to post your questions using the Q&A functions and keep tweeting using the hashtag beinghuman21. Welcome, Rosemary. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much, Lucy. And uh, thank you very much for the uh, town app um, guys. That was an excellent presentation. And um, I'm very remorse that I don't have it yet on all my iPads. So I will rectify that before the uh, week is out. Um, it looks great. And you're quite right, Fiona, the map does look very colourful, so I can't wait to see it. Um, hi, everyone. I'd like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to speak to you today. It's always nice to be back in Scotland, uh, even if it's virtually. So a key focus of my work is how we as a society understand and respond to disability and how we can work together to adopt a human rights approach to transform our society. The human rights framework is premised on the notion of the human family and recognises the inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all its members. The foundation of human rights, as we understand them, is that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Regardless of the universal application of the human rights framework, its principles and standards are not always applied to disabled people. The lived experience of disabled people is one of inequality, discrimination and segregation. And this reality was the catalyst for the disability rights movement to fight for the development of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The Convention reaffirms that disabled people are equal members of the human family. Its role is to ensure that the universal standard of human dignity and worth is respected and applied to disabled people in law, policy and practice. The convention clearly establishes and reinforces that disabled people are rights holders where impairment is just one aspect of human diversity. And as such, impairment cannot be the basis for the denial or limitation of human rights. The convention challenges the prevailing view that disabled people are inherently vulnerable due to their individual deficits. And hence disabled people require care, treatment and protection within a social welfare framework as a way of dealing with their special needs. Disability has for a long time been understood as an individual deficit an individual problem to be overcome or cured or to be suffered. This conflicts with the universal ideas we have of humanness. The view of disability as an individual deficit has been a powerful and enduring influence on the social conceptualization of disability throughout modern history. It has guided and dominated health and social care policy and clinical practice with the resulting assumption that both problems and solutions 
lie within people with disabilities rather than with society. Disabled people are viewed as abnormal, outside the norm, an exception to humanness. And this view is at the core of the devaluing of disabled people as inferior and other. This is ableism. Ableism has been dramatically highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic where several countries developed critical care triage mechanisms that singled out disability groups based on diagnostic status. Fundamentally, these groups were dispensable. They could be sacrificed to allow the real people to survive. This approach was evident in England with do not resuscitate orders for autistic people and people with learning disabilities. These policies and practices reveal the devaluing of disabled people and reflect the eugenic practices of the past. Our societies are based on very narrow ableist norms of humanness. The further and further away from the able norm a person's differences are, the greater the barriers to inclusion and participation. There is a point where those differences get labelled disability. It is this dynamic interaction of bodily, mental and cognitive difference with social structures that creates the phenomena of disability. For example, vision impairment has been, has been normalised into our public health system. Eye checks are available in every shopping centre. Glasses are affordable and readily available. So glasses are seen as normal, whereas canes and guide dogs are viewed as disability. The closest thing you'll find in a shopping centre is a charity donation box for guide dogs but you can't buy a collapsible cane. Glasses are seen as a fashion accessory, not assistive technology. No human has the complete repertoire of abilities in the normal range, suitable for all permutations of the physical and social environment. We are all limited in some respect of our capacities at some time. Yet we perceive and label only some traits that do not sit within dominant social arrangements as disability, a deficit of the person, regardless of whether those traits would be irrelevant with different social arrangements. We demonize or pity the individual, never question the system. Disabled people are too often seen not as engaged or active citizens, but as objects to be observed and as passive, passive recipients of wealth, health and social care. This has led to legal policy and program responses that are focused on care, treatment and protection of disabled people. Policies developed by export experts and informed by vested interests, but with little or no understanding of the lived experience of disabled people. The catch cry of nothing about us, without us, makes the simple point that disabled people need to be in the room where it happens. It's hardly surprising that disabled people are best place to know what they need. For example, in my country, Australia, the response to the pandemic excluded the voices of disabled people, despite many disabled people being at extremely high risk and living in con congregate care, and hence vulnerable to transmission. 
They were not recognised at all in the initial health response plan of February 2020. We had little or no access to personal protective equipment or information and communication that was targeted and relevant to the specific situations of disabled people. It was not until the end of April, over three months later, that disability was adequately addressed. Disabled people had to fight to get recognised and included. It was only through the concerted advocacy by organisations of disabled people that we were finally allowed into the room where decisions were being made. Disabled people are not seen as having agency in their own lives and the lives of others. Individual agency is central to our humanness and a recognition of personhood. It enables us to make our own decisions, to have personal choice and to express our views and preferences. For many disabled people, Individual agency is denied or limited by substitute decision-making arrangements, such as guardianship and mental health laws, or by decisions being made on behalf of disabled people by others in their lives, such as carers, family members, or service providers. Disabled people can spend their whole lives captured by service systems that manage and control all aspects of a person's life. They live a life dominated by paid carers without the opportunity to have meaningful interactions to develop personal relationships. Ableism has left disabled people demeaned, segregated, socially isolated, vulnerable to violence and abuse, and with substantial economic and social disadvantage. And their difference forms the basis for significant human rights violations across all areas of life. Because their difference is individualised, this oppression and marginalisation is attributed to them personally and to their difference, rather than being understood as societal or cultural practices that can be challenged or overturned through a focus on, on the structural mechanisms that need to be transformed. Evidence overwhelmingly demonstrates that segregated systems enable exploitation, violence and abuse. There are disability care systems where rape and sexual abuse is normalised. Education systems where locking disabled children in purpose-built cages is problem solving. Justice systems where people with cognitive differences can be indefinitely detained without conviction. Health systems where disabled people die from lack of primary health care and protection systems that strip disabled people of their autonomy and fundamental legal identity. In contrast, the ableist attitude and approach to disability, a human rights approach, is premised on the concept of diversity. Where impairments of all kinds are conceptualised as an inherent aspect of the human condition. It's also premised on an acknowledgement that the human condition is infinitely variable and people are not defined by just one personal characteristic. We are not a hom homogenous group. The intersection between disability and other multifaceted layers of identity and difference, such as sex, gender, identity, sexual orientation, intersex status, age, race, and ethnic origin, 
results in different experiences of discrimination and inequality. We can come to understand that all of us may experience negative responses to our differences in a multiplicity of ways. The power relations inherent in ableism and those inherent to, for example, racism, sexism, ageism, cis heterosexism, all share a common space of the devalued other in contrast to the privileged norm of humanness. A human rights approach embraces intersectionality and dismantles those power relations. This human rights approach is a much needed catalyst for modification of our social norms to fully reflect our human diversity. It seeks to build a normative frame that is representative of actual lived experience of the human condition. The convention sets standards for all societies where politics, policy and law need to be fashioned around a complete, comprehensive embrace of the human condition and experience. It is only through such an approach that we are able to meet the needs and aspirations of real life subjects and address human rights violations. The convention explicitly attaches the universal standard of human dignity to impairment. Through the lens of the convention and its human rights approach, we can fully understand that the denial and or diminishment of rights on the basis of impairment fails to meet international norms of human rights. Law and policy regimes based on care, treatment and protection, such as special schools, sheltered workshops, guardianship, mental health laws and indefinite detention provisions are no longer acceptable. Law, policy and practice, as we understand it, is about facilitating segregation and limitations to human rights, whereas the great transformation and innovation should be about law, policy and practice enabling the exercise of human rights. The challenge the convention sets for us all is to recognise the diversity of the human condition and reflect this in our laws, policies and practice, and not through special treatment of those outside those outdated norms. The fundamental basis of this shift begins with disabled people being recognised as active citizens and rights bearers, not passive recipients of care and protection. The shift continues through ending the denial and limitation of rights represented by segregation on the basis of disability. The essential task is to ensure that all human rights and fundamental freedoms are applied equally to disabled people, which means that health and social care services and supports should be focused on facilitating and upholding these human rights, not limiting or diminishing them. This shift requires legal, policy and program responses with core values of inclusion, elimination of individual and structural discrimination and removal of all barriers to full participation in all aspects of our society. To achieve this, we need not just reformation, but transformation of our society. It's not enough, never enough, to just reform systems and practices 
so that the old care treatment and protection systems are enhanced or closer to the human rights standard. We must transform systems and practices through centering human rights and human diversity. This will not be easy or quick. It will require confronting established systems and ways of thinking. It will require challenging the associated vested interests. It will require us to expect and participate in planning the transition from those outdated systems and understandings of disability to transform our society to one where disabled people are genuinely equal members of society. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rosemary, uh, for that fascinating and thought-provoking presentation. I am filled with questions already, uh, and uh, no doubt our audience are too. I can see questions coming in on the Q&A function, and I know that uh, Fiona, Sandy and John have already got questions lined up too. What I'd like to suggest to everybody now is that we take a short uh, screen and stretch break for 10 minutes um, to give everybody a chance to freshen up, etc. And after we come back, we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, uh, although we always run, uh, uh, never seem to have enough time with these things, um, but we will hopefully be able to get through everybody's questions and hold on to Rosemary for just that little bit longer. So thank you again so much, Rosemary. Thanks, everybody, for sticking with us. No flipping, no flipping channels, please. Uh, and we'll see you all back here in about 10 minutes' time. And welcome back to Rosemary now, too, who's joining us. So um, I can see that the audience have been posting questions, which is fantastic, and we'll come to those in a bit. Um, but to start us off, we've got some questions from... Fiona, John and Sandy. So if I could turn to them first. First, I think Fiona has a question about the human rights framework and local authorities. Fiona, over to you. <clears throat> how, can, how can the human rights framework make sure local authorities provide high quality support to people with learning disabilities, including making sure they are supported to leave hospital. Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, a human rights a human rights approach would require that the health system be engaged with the person and their family, um, and that systems are set up and put into place and that there's a, a network of support um, that the person requires, that the person identifies that they need. Um, it's about centering the service around the person and making sure the person has a voice in the process to be able to get the supports and the services that they need to be able to, to leave hospital and live independently and be included in the community. Thanks. So if the local school, oh, sorry. Sorry, Rosemary, I thought you had finished. No, 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 I was just going to say, so if, if we adopted a human rights approach, the local service would frame its work around the standards and principles within the CRPT, and that would require that they engage with people with disability, whether that be on the collective level or on the individual level when it comes down to, you know, individual cases and making sure that people who are leaving either care or hospital have their individual needs met. Thank you so much for that. And 
I, I think it's 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 so interesting what you say, and it might be as well related um, or relevant for the next question that we have from John, which is a question about self-directed support, which of course we have in legislation here in Scotland, and which does in that law provide for um, obligations on local authorities and health and social care powers to do certain things to ensure that people have choice and control. But that's not always the case in reality. So over to you, John, to ask your question. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, just to say, Rosemary, your presentation was absolutely amazing. So I just wanted to just say that to you. Um, so Thanks, my, John. <laughs> my question is, why is it even with site self-directed support, people with learning disability are still not getting the freedom of choice, especially during transitions? Um, I, look, I can't comment that much about Scotland, yeah. but um, what I can say, oh, excuse me, I've got a bug attacking me. Um, what I can say is that services need to be there for the individual and they have to meet the individual's needs and that services shouldn't just stop at arbitrary points. Transition points are incredibly important and there needs to be a trajectory that the individual can be supported through and develop um, develop them develop as individuals to grow and to, to, to have um, the ability to take those next steps forward in their lives. And so their supports need to be flexible and they need to be responsive to the individual. And that trying to isolate them and silo them into certain periods with no no clear supports through that transition process and a plan to be flexible about how the supports may look in, in the coming years um, would not be meeting a human rights approach. Thanks, Rosemary. Thanks so much. And now I think Sandy has a question that Una is going to introduce. Um, so, Sandy, you were wanting to ask about long-term support plans. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, long-term support plans. I, I feel, you know, when people are um, leaving school and if, when I was certainly leaving school year, years and years ago, I was, I was brought into a meeting and I was told my support plan f f from school would um, stop once I leave school. But in my case, I, I feel... Your, if you've got a disability or a learning disability, your support plan should never, um, you know, uh, uh, stop. I feel that your support plan should go with with all, you know, all the way through your life until, until the ba basically the day you die, because that that support that that support plan isn't going to, you know, benefit anybody else. No, I mean, support plans um, are, are it should be designed to, to go with the person, yeah. there to meet those individual needs. And so, as I was saying to John, support plans should be allowed to allow people to live their lives how they wish to live them. And that, that will require that they know they have the supports to be able to meet their goals and and to live the way they wish to live, um, you 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 can't expect that you know just because you're leaving education that somehow moving into adulthood you won't need supports. So your supports need to be able to grow and change with you and to meet those differing conditions. But they should still recognise that you will need those supports, but you will need them in different ways for different things. 
Yeah, and I feel and I feel as well. Um, you, you, you know, it would say it would it would save you when you go to for, for an employer or, or or something, or if you go to a a a, a, a support um provider, um, you know, this might be um for respite or. You, you know a day a daycare service or, or anything like that 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 would i think this would stop you having to repeat yourself you you would just be able to say look here's my support plan here's everything that you need to know about me if you want to help me up you know update that and and make I, you know, I think it would take a, I, I think it would take a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the pressure off the, the person that's actually going through through these challenges from day to day life. I think. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have to fight for your support every time something new happens in your life. Otherwise, you end up in a situation where you're 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 fighting the system the whole time and. What it should be doing is supporting you. And, you know, support is about helping things function and grow and live and strive. So um, if you've got your support plan and your support plan should be attached to you and go with you and travel with you as a bit of a companion type thing, um, you can take it with you and you can know you've got that they're available if you wish to to move into something different and try something different. I I I, I love your um, power. I I I I, re- I really really do wish we could take you to um, Scotland and um, y- y- you know um, because because everything that you've said in your um, presentation today is it's just really really been heartwarming and, and it's a lot of things. That we we that we can develop into the, the, the human rights town app and um, make it more inclusive for people in Scotland and um, to, to, to 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 develop in, in their own little wee bubble or st- strategy. So thank you so much for everything today. Thank you, Sandy. Um, the, there you have it, Rosemary. I I, I fear if you if. The next time you were ever to visit Scotland, you might actually not be allowed to leave. Um, um, and if I can go back to Fiona now, I think Fiona's got one final question uh, for you from the Human Rights Town app development team. Over to you, Fiona. <clears throat> How do we ensure that people with learning disabilities are not forgotten about and included in everything we do? Um, well, if we're drawing on a human rights approach, um, and this is this is central to the objectives of incorporating the CRPD into Scottish national law, and so advocacy and representation of people with disability will be very important. The convention um, embraces the notion that people with disabilities have to be included in decisions about their lives. So at the, at the collective level, then their representative organisations should be involved in the policy process, that individuals should be involved, centrally involved in decisions about their lives. And so you need to be able to be visible. You need to be able to, a human rights approach would want people with disability to be visible and to be active participants. So decision-making in the area of disability shouldn't be left to professionals who are separate from the lives of disabled people. It should be the fact that um, disabled people are in there as part of the policymaking team. And that's true for people with learning disabilities and their representative organisations. 
So organisations of people with learning disabilities should be involved and actively participating in the policy processes. And this is what should be um, part of the process that comes out from the Human Rights Bill that is being discussed in Scotland. And the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities is a dynamic group. And look at the very innovative way you're making people with dis learning disabilities visible and doing really creative ideas such as the, the Human Rights Town App. That's a fabulous, fabulous um, project that you've been working on and an incredible addition to helping educate not just people with learning disabilities about human rights and the CRPD, but people in general. Thank you. Thanks so much. And yeah, I, I think that's, that's exactly what you say there at the end about the app. Um, I, I love it. And I, I think it's got huge potential for telling everybody about their rights, um, you know, as well as people with learning disabilities. It's so colourful, it's so easy to use, it's so engaging. So anybody um, in the audience who still hasn't downloaded it yet, why not go to the App Store or the Google Play and get it on your device. Um, well, thank you so much uh, so far, everyone who's been posting questions. And now I'd like to turn to the questions that have been posted in the Q&A by our audience members, Rosemary. Um, and the first question that's been posed is, um, and I, I think you've touched on this a little bit in your, in your presentation and also in answer to some of the previous questions, but there's maybe more you can tell us. Um, what do you suggest are the key actions that are needed to challenge societal misperception of disability and disabled people, which have led to things like non-consenting do not resuscitate orders and the wider lack of consideration of disabled people and their expertise during the pandemic? Um. I mean, it's about confronting ableism. So it's looking at the mechanisms that can change the way people understand um, disability. So it's about, and it's about changing attitudes, but it's more than that. It's about challenging structures. And if you really want to change attitudes, you have to challenge things at both the institutional level, so the government and leadership level, at the policy level and at the individual level. So there's a leadership role that's needed that, that addresses the structural stuff, that takes it on board to accept that we cannot limit the human rights of disabled people and that you put in place laws and, laws and policy that enacts that, that takes away those systems, takes away, removes those systems that deny or limit human rights and puts in place mechanisms to support people to exercise their rights. Um, the Republic of Ireland has been going through a process where it abolished guardianship, but it has had a, had a sort of a, a breather in that promulgation to enable policy and work to happen around ensuring that there was effective uh, supported decision-making mechanisms to replace the old substituted decision-making mechanisms. Mm. So it's about taking a targeted measured approach. And as I said, this is not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy. Um, and it's also about 
the voice of people with disability, but it's the voice of people with disability being heard as rights bearers, mm-hmm. not, not as, as a benevolent charity that needs to be um, supported in a, in a demeaning way, but something that is pos- positive and engages in a partnership with government and industry and business to be able to address ableism and the vested interests that drive that devaluing of disabled people. Thank you so much for that. And and every uh, every answer leads me to think of a billion more questions. Um, I, I'll move on to the next. I'm going to draw the line at 11. I'll tell you that now. <laughs> um, um, Today, it just so happens, is Budget Day in Scotland, actually. And oh, I was going to ask a question about finance and disabled people's human rights. So it's great to see that David's put me to the post in the audience Q&A there. And he's posted a question on this. And his question is, what role has GDP, GDP gross domestic product, played in excluding disabled people from society? Uh, would a move, for example, towards something like stakeholder capitalism or a well-being economy improve access to society for disabled people? Um, well, A, I'm not an economist. Um, B, Government budgets are always a mystery to me, but anyway, I suppose I'll say this. Um, Domestic product is an elusive, you know, term. And whilst I'm not an expert, one would say that if one has set a goal and we need to set a goal of inclusion and... If you take a planned strategic approach to it, you should be able to build in mechanisms that ensure that you can meet those targets. Now, governments seem to be able to do it for other areas, whether it be infrastructure, whether it be you know, education, health, whatever, but they need to take the same sort of approach to mainstreaming disability and ensuring that it operates within a human rights context. Now, I know that's technically a bit bit as an answer, but um, I mean, really gross domestic product or um, domestic product is... I mean, one could say it's nearly an illusion. I mean, um, sort of depends and fluctuates. And so it's an estimate and commodities change all the time. Income, you know, structures change all the time. So it's about how the government um, is committed or not to a human rights approach. If they are committed to a human rights approach, they should be able to budget around it. Thanks so much for that. And and one of one of the other areas of work that the the Alliance has been involved in here in Scotland, along with the Scottish Human Rights Commission and partners in academia, is human rights budget work and has been quite encouraging to see increasing moves in that direction and also consideration of things like a well-being economy, a caring economy, um, equality budgeting and gender budgeting and so on being taken. Um, Now you mentioned uh, an example of potential law change in Ireland and this I think ties in with one of the questions that um, one of our other audience members has has, um, asked in relation to examples of change that might actually be taking may bear positive fruit. 
that Chloe's asked a question about Scotland is currently in the process of rethinking the way that people can access support through the creation of a national care service. But that's obviously taking place in an environment of limited resources and a political battle between central and local government. So are there any examples that you know of internationally of rights-based transformation that have supported independent living that we could learn from here in Scotland? I mean, it's always useful to look at what different countries are, are trying. I mean, my own country, Australia, introduced the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Now, the legislation and the framework around the NDIS um, is enshrined within, you know, a human rights approach. Whether it always achieves that, you can, you can argue, argue the toss. And to give it its due, it's a huge program. It's um, a national program. It provides disability support plans for and individual budgets for 10% of people with disability. So they're the people that are, um, that require daily living supports. And so it's about giving choice and control to individuals. So they decide how and by whom their supports are provided and that those budgets are in the control of the individuals. Those uh, plans follow them. They're attached to those people. They are their own individual plans. Um, it's supposed to follow people through their life course trajectory. And so there's many positives and many human rights elements to the NDIS, but um, there is also still some, some limitations to it in terms of implementation and rollout. So, um, but it's still quite a good example and it's worth other countries looking at it to pick up, um, you know, the positive aspects of the, the structure. So it would be, I mean, it's still, when I say it's, it's not been, when I say it's not been out long, I mean, in 2014, it started to be rolled out, but it's a massive plan. It's a huge budget. It's the largest social welfare um, program that's been released in Australia since our universal health care. And so, I mean, data is still good. Intersectional data is still really only coming to be understood. Um, look, Spain, a Catholic country, has confronted um, forced sterilisation of people with disability. Um, so women and girls with disabled women and girls have also on the 3rd of December been apologised to for historic harm through forced sterilisation. Now, this, these, are, these are massive changes in a, in a country like Spain. So there are steps being taken and there are they're small steps, but they're steps that recognise the human rights of people with disability and the injuries that have been done in the name of care, treatment and protection um, and in the name of eugenics and that search for perfection and that, that idealised concept of, you know, the ideal able norm. Thanks so much. I, I, I think that is so thought provoking. And I have to say, I hadn't heard that in an announcement about Spain. So that that is incredibly encouraging if countries mm. are feeling able as well to, you know, publicly take that level of responsibility uh, and admit to the mistakes of the past um, with a view to then making sure things like that never, ever happen again. 
mm-hmm. um, and and people here in the audience, I, I think you've already come across this with Rosemary, but colleagues and friends at Engender, which is Scotland's feminist policy organisation and Inclusion Scotland have worked together on some work on disabled women's uh, sexual and reproductive health rights in Scotland here called Our Bodies, Our Rights, and mm. maybe get colleagues to share links to that in the chat on as well. Um, moving on now to the next question, um, Ken is asking about digital technology and whether or not you think that that's got the potential to support or hinder the realization of human rights? Um, like everything, there's, there's positives and then there's negatives to it. Um, on the one hand, there's always the worry about the digital divide. So um, people with disability, sorry, um, disabled people are very often um, economically marginalised. And so it's always of a concern that if the ability to be able to access the digital world and the digital economy um, is based on resources, then people with disability will be left behind. Um, And it's also about the access to the digital environment and whether the, the app designers like our team here at um, SCLD, um, the app designers and the web designers and the you know computer designers and engineers are making universally accessible um, equipment, and so is the digital world accessible to people with disability. The digital economy has opened up areas of employment and self-employment for people with disability. That has been a real positive. Um, In some ways, the digital economy has enabled and opened up the care, the support industry, and made things like finding new support people a lot more easy for people with, um, for disabled people. But There's also the traps of um, the digital economy and not only the digital economy, but the digital world, the digital interface through things like Facebook and Twitter and people's engagement with that and people's vulnerability in that space. And so it's about also making sure that people have information about being safe in the, on the web, about being safe and um, being able to engage with people in a meaningful and safe way. So the digital world has lots of bonuses, but it also has some, some drawbacks. As we move to the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence will take a bigger and bigger role in our lives. And so it's incumbent upon us to make sure that the researchers that collect the data, that do the algorithms, that put together the algorithms, take a diversity approach to that collection of data. The data needs to be able to reflect the whole of the human condition. And if people with... um, disability or people with learning disabilities are left out of that research matrix, then what you get at the end is not going to be accessible for disabled people. And so that, again, will be a little bit like the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was when we went from flexible agrarian economies to standardised factory work and people that did that couldn't meet that standardized work practice were excluded from the economic life of the community and so we could have the next industrial the fourth industrial age um, being inaccessible to people with disability 
because those algorithms haven't factored in human diversity. Yeah, thanks so much. And one of the, you prompt me there thinking back many, many moons ago, a few decades now, to my introduction in a university seminar to um, uh, feminism and the public private split as well that happened in, in our society and with the Industrial Revolution and what, what that resulted in for, for many, many women uh, in, mm -hmm. yeah. in the UK and industrialised society. So um, it's so interesting to hear your views about, you know, the potential and the opportunities that there, that there is in technology, digital technology and AI, but also some of these huge pitfalls that we've really got to try and, and uh, our best to avoid. And certainly I think, you know, at the Alliance, one of the things we found during the pandemic when, when all engagement has been done digitally, um, it's both um, opened up the organisation, opened us up to having events more like this, for example, and hearing from speakers like yourself direct and live around the world. And it's enabled many of our members and partners to engage much more with us in a way than they would have if we'd been having face-to-face -face events. For example, people living in more remote and rural parts of Scotland when, when events are in the central belt and things like that. But at the same time, it's also been a challenge for people because you have to have that connectivity, you have to have the technology, you have to have the kit, you have to have the money to buy the data. Um, you know, there's so much that can actually get in the way. Um, yep. um, one of the other things that the Alliance has been involved in actually for, for others who are watching this as well might be interested in, in partnership with Scottish Care and Voices of Experience is developing a set of human rights principles for digital health and social care. And I think many of the points that you were raising there, raised, Rosemary, have been addressed in those in terms of it, you know, digital has to be a meaningful choice for people um, and access has to be meaningful and so on. So um, I'm sure colleagues will put a link to that in the chat function as well. So thank you. Um, I know uh, it's already raised its awful head a couple of times in our discussion, but I, I, I feel the need to kind of go back to addressing COVID a, a bit now, if that's okay, Rosemary. And uh, obviously we've seen, you know, the, the absolutely devastating impact that the pandemic has had, and particularly the disproportionate impact that it had on some members of society, including disabled people and people living with long-term conditions and unpaid carers. What do you think are some of the elements of a human rights based approach that need to be thought of, included, acted on to ensure that in any future crises, we don't see that same disproportionate impact? And, and particularly the disproportionate impact it's had on the intersectional groups that we're talking about, so disabled women and disabled minority ethnic. Well, I, I go back to the very core of um, the human rights approach, and that's to recognise people with disability as part of human diversity. And so any planning, any, any planning for disaster risk reduction should include people with disability. And that planning should take an intersectional approach. So you shouldn't just be talking to um, organisations of people with disability. You should be talking to with organisations of women with disability. You should be talking to, you know, organisations of children and youth with disability, to people with learning disabilities. So it's, it's about ensuring that you've got an understanding about what the needs are of your diverse community and how to respond to it in any um, disaster situation. You have the Sendai framework, which gives you a, a, a human rights framework to, to address disaster risk reduction. So there's ways that um, governments can go about it, but I think it's first incumbent upon them to be make sure that the voices of people with disability are involved in the planning of any um, 
disaster or emergency situation. And we should be pre-planning. We know it's going to happen again. You know, people have been telling us for, for years we were going to have a, a pandemic. The only problem is nobody really listened or heard. So, you know, there was a handful of epidemiologists around the world that knew this was coming. The rest of us were shocked. My God, where did that come from? It was like a freight train. You know, um, whereas these guys have been waiting for it to happen. So the other thing about the COVID response was the greatest vulnerability came from congregate settings, aged care facilities, prisons, group homes, residential care facilities. People can't physically distance when they're living in congregated situations. So if anything, COVID should have been an alarm bell about states continuing to support congregate-based care. I mean, they shouldn't be continuing congregate-based congregate care because we know that those types of closed environments lead to violence and abuse and exploitation of people with disability but they also leave them inherently vulnerable, not just to violence and abuse, but also at risk during something like a pandemic. And they were, they were highly vulnerable. So ending institutionalization and getting people with uh, people, disabled people out of institutions and living independently in the community should be a priority. And that's about ensuring that there's affordable and accessible housing and individualised support packages and mechanisms to support people to live in the community. The other thing about COVID that was incredibly stark and a horrid reminder of the devaluing of people with disability was the critical care triage processes and the arbitrary nature of them. You know, just picking diagnostic groups as a process of selection of who would die and who would not die is not a way to give a clinical response to a health situation. And so we must ensure that in any situation that occurs like that again, that there needs to be a clinical basis for that sort of rationalisation. We can't say it needs to be first come, first serve. That's not going to get your health system to work effectively during a pandemic. But you need to work, work it in such a way that it respects the human rights of all people. And so it should be based on a clinical decision, not an arbitrary decision based on diagnostic group. Thanks so much uh, for that, Rosemary. And um, you know, I, I really hope that there's there in Scotland anyway. There's um, plans already underway for an independent inquiry about COVID and and how the country has responded to it. And many of our members and partners have been involved in the consultation and engagement work we've done on that. And certainly. The, the submissions that we've made have, have led to some really strong calls for in, ensuring not just what you're, you're talking about, but also that, you know, crisis planning needs to have people at the centre of it. Um, and we're joined by a doggo. Yes, my, board, my, my border collie is now disgracing himself on the floor behind me. It and has, I'll let you... I'll let you know there's a little Scottish story behind my border collie. Please tell I us. I was travelling with some uni friends and a friend of mine from Glasgow um, many moons ago, back in the early 90s. And um, we're in the car, we're coming across the, 
Scottish border from England. And Keith, my friend, said to me something about the next town. And I said, Jedburg. And he went, what? And I said, Jedbra. And he gave me stick about that, I think, for the basically the rest of my life it's going to be. So um, my dog's name is Jed in honour of Jedburgh. I love that story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I have to say, it's been one of the absolute joys of moving to digital, working on uh, during the pandemic, has been getting to see people's doggos, uh, getting to see people's kids, um, the sort of random uh, daily life that happens, um, albeit it is a bit odd having offices in our homes now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I should have blurred my background, but I didn't realise he was going to do a cameo appearance. No, we, we love it. We absolutely love it. And he he's a beautiful dog. So thank you so much, Jen, he's a for very joining beautiful, us. He's, he is a very beautiful border collie, yes. Um, and um, well, we're, de and we're delighted, obviously, this time you can't physically be with us, but that you're joining us virtually here in Scotland. So I've just got a couple of final questions to finish Certainly. up with. Um, and I must uh, confess that I have a, a bit of a vested interest in this next question, because as I said at the beginning, I'm currently working on Scotland's next, next National Action Plan for Human Rights. And Scotland had a very successful first action plan that ran from 2013 to 2017. And development work has been going on on that since then, obviously interrupted as so many things have been by COVID. And my question also does pick up on the final question posed by our audience members. And it picks up on something that you've already noted, which is that obviously there are plans a way now um, for Scotland to incorporate not just the CRPD, but a, a plethora of other treaties and human rights into Scots law. Now, obviously, that's just a huge job in and of itself, and that's going to take, I think, several years. But after this is done, really, what do you think needs to happen to make that law real in people's lives? Um, it's sort of a twofold thing. I mean, it's about it's about making sure that it's got the mechanisms in it that the judiciary, the legislators, and the administrators are have strong knowledge of it and understand um, its frameworks and its underlying approach. And the same for people on the street. So not just disabled people, but people in general are aware of what the implications are, what the issues are, that having these instruments embedded in national law means for people. And because it's not just about people with disability, it's about if we're talking ICCPR, we're talking ICESCA, sorry, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. You, you're talking about the diversity of our, our community. And so everybody needs to have a greater understanding about human rights and what the standards and principles are and what they fundamentally mean. And so I would say that's, that's one of the big steps is to make sure that that education process and awareness process um, works and works effectively. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Sorry, have I interrupted you there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time together today. And um, before we finish, Rosemary, I've got one last question for you, which is something 
at the Alliance that, that we like to ask all our guest speakers um, because we're great advocates of the What Matters to You movement. So um, before you leave us, Rosemary, or before I finish up with some words and thank you, obviously, before you leave us, could you tell us please a little bit about what matters to you? Um, my family matters to me. Um, my work matters to me. I really enjoy my work. I, I have spent the last 20 years working either on or with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities as a human rights lawyer um, and as a um, person that's only ever practised in the area of international law, I would like to see the convention and the committee earn the respect that it deserves and have this particular convention have as much drive as what the Human Rights Committee and the International Covenant on civil and political rights has. I think it's um, important that it gets recognised, not as an advocate, just as an advocacy tool, but as a piece of international law. And I think people forget that, that it's a legal process and that it needs to operate as a legal process. And so um, that matters to me. It matters to me that the the convention is taken seriously and that we can engage with states at the level of good faith and that they take on their obligations in good faith and act on them. Because I firmly believe, and I know that it's not going to happen in my lifetime, that social inclusion is possible. I'm sure it must be possible. And so if states act in good faith and implement their obligations, engage with disabled people and plan for the transformation that's required in society, dismantle the ableism, um, social inclusion is possible. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick, but it is possible. Thank you so much, Rosemary. And I think that's an incredibly positive and optimistic note on which to finish. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for today, but I I think we can all agree that this has been such an excellent way to mark and celebrate this year's International Human Rights Day, but to still to start off the Academy's new Being Human series um, brought to you by the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, thanks to the Alliance, the Academy and SCLD for organising, hosting and partnering today's event and for inviting me to chair it. Um, thanks to Una, John, Fiona and Sandy for telling us all about the Human Rights Town app. Please don't forget to check it out uh, at your latest, at your nearest app store. Uh, and of course, last but by no means least, uh, a huge thanks to our guest speaker, Rosemary KS. It, it's been such a privilege and honour to hear from you. So everyone, please note that information about future Academy Being Human events will be announced on the Alliance's website and in the weekly bulletin. Today's event has been recorded and will be broadcast tomorrow on International Human Rights Day. The Alliance elves will be beavering away between now and then to edit and subtitle it for us. Um, before you go, please do take a couple of minutes to complete an evaluation form. The link is in the chat box. It's incredibly important that we continue to build on and improve these events and your views really do help us do that. So thank you again, everyone. And wherever you may be heading off to now, please do take care, stay safe, goodbye. <laughs>